All right, Matthew chapter 18. We're just gearing up, working our way through here now. So, Well, the light is right above you. It's darker over there. Yeah. We need like a, a throne with a light above it for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 18. Um, I thank you all for being here tonight, folks online. Thank you all for joining us as well. Um, we're going to read through the first 10 verses. I don't know how far we'll get tonight, um, but we'll see. So Matthew chapter 18, we'll start off in verse 1. Uh, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them uh, uh, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble themselves as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso, and whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of, the, because of offenses, but it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting life. Fire. <clears throat> and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to, to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. Father, we thank you once again for the time that we have to uh, study your word. And as we take a look at this information, may we allow your word to be the final authority in all things, uh, that we come to a greater knowledge and appreciation of it. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now, um, there's a lot that's taking place in those first 10 verses. And I don't know how far we're going to get into this, but... We'll see what happens. And it's it's really interesting because what we start off with is where is it that we find ourselves is in verse one is you've got the disciples going to Jesus Christ and saying what? Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? All right. And of course, this is right on the heels of what we've read over in Matthew chapter 17 and chapter 16. And one of the things that we've pointed out is if you go back to chapter 16, um, verse 15 uh, when this is right after Peter's confession of thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, verse 17, and Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now we talked about that, those, those two verses uh, quite some time ago. But notice what happens here is there's there's this issue of who is it that this information was revealed to by the Father was to Peter, right? And of course, that's one of those things that we see. And what do we find out in verse 19? He says, and I will give unto thee, singular, the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now, this, this instance here is who is it that has this revelation of this truth to him is Peter. And then who is it that Christ says, I'm going to give the keys of the kingdom to is Peter, right? And of course, we've gone through and we've seen these different things. Then Jesus Christ in verse 21 starts to tell them about him going to be uh, delivered unto the um, um, the elders and the chief priests and the scribes be killed and raised the third day. And Peter's response is no. Right? And of course, we talked about the issue of how he was so strong and adamant with his belief that Jesus is the Christ. But here, this is something that he falters on uh, and he doesn't believe that it's true. And of course, we've gone through and talked about those things. And if you get over to chapter 17 and where we left off the last time, 
is you end up with this issue of the tribute money, right? And when we last left off at the end of verse 27, he says, uh, and of course, this is Peter and, J and Jesus here in verse 27, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. Go thou to the sea, and cast an hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of, of, of money. That take and give unto them for me and thee. Now we talked about that issue of who is it that has the tribute money is Jesus Christ and Peter. And then, of course, that's where, we kinda, that's where we left off the last time, going into chapter 18. And then in chapter 18, verse 1, the question is what? Who's the greatest in the kingdom? And so what's interesting is you start, you start seeing these guys, what are they doing? Um, they're starting to get an idea of some things, but they're really, really lost on a lot of other, thing, uh, a lot of other things too. But what do they do is they start to argue about who's going to have more authority. Well, who was it in chapter 16 that Christ gave the keys of the kingdom to? Peter. And, and, and that, you know, that's that issue that he started off with there. And, of course, what? some churches will do with that is they'll say well he's the one and we're going to build the church on him and he's the first pope right <laughs> and to get into the whole all that stuff as well but <clears throat> what's interesting here is they do understand that there is some government authority that's going to be in this kingdom but again they're they're lost on a lot of other things as well um, but notice go over to chapter 20 uh, and we we see the same same type of issue over here in, in uh, Matthew chapter 20. And we're not going to go through the parable uh, in the first part of chapter 20, but I do want us to notice something here real quick. Who were the other, and, and uh, I think Lisa may have mentioned it last week, and a couple other people did as well. Um, who is it that went up into the mountain with Peter um, in Matthew chapter 17? Was It was Peter, James, and John, right? Now, when we get over here, Matthew chapter 20, and of course, once we get over to Matthew chapter 20, we're going to see this. There's an issue of Jesus Christ is bringing up in verse 1. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And what he does is he makes an agreement with people saying, I'm going to give you a penny for the day for how long, you know, when you work, I'm going to give you a penny a day. And so then what happens is there's people that's out there, they're doing work. Then a little bit later on, he goes out. And of course, we'll talk about the timing of all this stuff. He goes out again, gets more labor, says, I'm going to pay you a penny for the day. And then he goes all the way down until it's almost towards the end of the day. And he goes out and gets more people and he gonna, he's going to give them a penny for a day. And what happens is, is he starts to pay them out. And the issue there is, who is it the first ones that are paid out were the last ones that come in to work. And the ones that were there first to work were the last ones to get paid. But every one of them got the same pay, right? Every one of them got a penny. Now, that's the overview of, of, of what that is dealing with there. And, of course, <clears throat> that issue comes up. The same thing that we have here. Notice, um, drop down to verse... Um, drop down to verse 10. We'll just jump into this. Notice it says, But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. So the idea is the ones who were there in the early in the morning, they're thinking what? We're going to get more than the people that's been here for an hour. And what was the, what was the, what was the deal that was offered to them is what? I want to give you a penny to work for the day. And, and what happens is, is they get to the end and what are they expecting? They're expecting more because, well, we've been here longer. But what was the, what was the deal that every one of them was offered was, you're going to get a penny for the day work. And every one of them get a penny. So there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes along with that. And like I said, once we get over to chapter 20, we'll see that. But notice in verse 11, And when they had received it, that penny, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. Now, one of the things you think about that, the people that show up last, who was the first person to show up in Matthew was who? John the Baptist, right? And what we get over here is 
you've got time that goes on. Christ goes and gets the 12, and those 12 are working with them, and there's more people that's coming in. So then the idea is, does John deserve more than the 12 do? And that's kind of the idea of what's taking place there, right? And you can even expand that even farther and say, well, if, if, John, if John deserves more than these, then Abraham's got to have even more than them, right? And you can go on and on. But that's the idea of where they're, where they're going. <clears throat> but notice, drop down to verse 20. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, why I wanted to bring this up. Um, their, their idea and the way, that, the way that you think about things like that, they're thinking about it as a Gentile would think about it. Right, and that that's what he's that's what he's getting at. And notice, it, it gets even worse because notice in verse twenty, then came to him the mother of, of Zebedee's children, and, uh, with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left, in thy kingdom. So. When, when you're dealing with this, um, you got the mother of Zebedee's children. Well, who are the Zebedee's children? <laughs> James and John. The, the, the other two guys that were up there in the mountain with, with Peter, and, they're, and, and the mom's showing up saying, her, her basically, her idea is what? Well, Peter was there. He's got the keys of the kingdom. He's got this stuff. He's got the tax money. He's got all this stuff. But could you at least put my two guys, my two sons, one on the left and one on the right to rule with you? And, and again, the, the whole idea behind that is, is the kingdom that they're, that they're dealing with at that time, it's a Gentile kingdom, right? And so then they're, the way that they think about things is in that way. Notice <clears throat> verse 22, but Jesus answered and said, ye know not what ye ask. <laughs> you don't really know what's going on, but notice, <clears throat> are ye able to drink of the cup? that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, they say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of what? My father. Basically, what he's telling, them, telling her is what? The Father has a way that the kingdom is going to work. He's going to be the one that's going to decide this. You're not coming to me to be able to do this. Notice, and when the ten heard it. Now, again, stop and think about this for a second. <clears throat> do we have, and, and I'm trying not to teach Matthew 20 yet, but is there a time in history with Israel that you've got a split of ten and two? The northern kingdom were ten, and the southern kingdom, the tri southern tribes were two, right? Still one kingdom, and, and so you see that you see that, right? That there's this there's there, there's this split. Um, the ten northern tribes, those are the first ones to go off into captivity, and then the two southern tribes are the ones that go off into captivity a little bit later on. But both of them are are in captivity, and it's interesting because notice, and when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. What's he saying? The way the Gentiles rule is not the way the, the, the kingdom's going to work. That's their, that's their idea. And you've got to think, isn't that what Peter's thinking the entire time is, well, we're just going to set up a kingdom. We're going to run things just like, and the rest of them are thinking the exact same thing. But he's saying what? <clears throat> Verse 26, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Now, what's interesting is, and we'll see this a little bit later on. Notice Verse 27. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. So stop and think about this. <clears throat> if you think the way, the way they're thinking is what? The greatest is up here. 
the lease is down here and they're thinking, you know, we've got this right here. What he's saying is what? The greatest is going to do what? Huh? I'm sorry. Go ahead. What were you saying? Are they all going to be equal? Is that what you mean? Well, so, so the idea there is he's saying, let the greater be the one that serves all the... When you go back, hold your place there. Go to, go to Romans. What do you mean? No, no, no. And we, we could talk about that. But notice, <clears throat> go over to. Uh, well, let me ask you this real quick. Yeah. Go ahead. Everything you're talking about right now, is mm -hmm. this referring to what we would call the new earth? The, the kingdom here on earth, okay. yeah. The, the governmental structure here on earth. And, and there's parallel yeah. to the earthly kingdom and the heavenly, what, you know, what we're going to be a part of. Um, Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Romans chapter 9. And, and notice, notice, notice that we have the same type of, type of issue that's going on here. Um, in Romans chapter 9, Paul brings up, brings up this same issue um, that I want to make sure that we see. And... Um, Notice here, Romans chapter, Romans chapter 9. Um, let's just jump here in verse, verse um, 8. Um, in Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, what Paul does is he pauses for a second to explain what's going on with the program for the nation of Israel, how it's going to be put on pause and on hold until God will bring that back up. But notice here in verse 8, he says, That is, they which are the children of the flesh... These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah will have, shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Now, Pause there for a second. What people do with this verse is what? There's some that God chose to salvation, and there are some that God chose to go to hell. That is one of the most despicable doctrines that I've ever heard, and they use these verses to do this. In fact, they say Paul was the first Calvinist, and they say that he's the greatest Calvinist. Because who is it that uses words like called, and predestined <laughs> an election is Paul. But if you just pull verses out, then you can do whatever you want. But notice he gives us exactly what's going on. Notice in verse 12, it was said unto her, the what? The elder shall serve the younger. The idea there is what? The greatest is going to serve the least. And the idea, and you'll see this as we go through Matthew chapter 18 here and chapter 20 as well, there's an issue of humility. And what the greatest is going to be able to do is be humble like the child, and we see that in the context, to do what? To serve them. And instead of saying, I'm the big chief, I'm the top dog, they're going to be able to, they're going to, be able to know who's the greatest by what? their service everything here notice he says the elder shall what serve the younger when you're talking about election every time in scripture when you talk about election it's talking about election to service not to salvation but to service how do we know he tells us right there right in verse 13 he says as it is written jacob have i loved and esau have i hated well who is jacob Israel, who is Esau, Edom. He's talking about the, the, the nations that were in her belly with the time that she was pregnant. That's what he's dealing with there. He's, and you go back to the Old Testament Scripture, you see that he says, there's two nations within thy womb. He's looking at the nations, not the specific pers person saying, well, I'm going to save this one, I'm going to send the other one to hell. He's talking about nations, and the issue there is, is what we find out is this same idea 
that we have going on there. Now, um, always save people to serve. Yeah. 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 It doesn't, right? Mm -mm. It's always save people. It's, serve. it's always service. Um, go back to Genesis chapter 25. <clears throat> um, hold your place there in Matthew 20 because we're, we will come back. But Genesis chapter 25, um, and I want you, I want you to see that. Um, So you've got the elect is the elect is Jesus Christ. Yeah. But then you also have the elect angels and then you have the elect, which would also be the nation of Israel. Um, but when he's talking about specifically us, the elect would be saved people. It's people who are saints yeah. is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is, is they get their identity the nation of Israel ha will have their identity because of Christ. And because he's the elect, they're the elect. We have our identification with Christ since he's the elect, we're the elect. Right? So he's talking about saved people. Anytime, any t and, and that's, that's one of the biggest travesties about that doctrine is to, to stop and think. I mean, think about this for a second. To stand in front of a person and say, I think that God elected you to go to hell. That's disgusting to even think about, much less speak to a person. But they won't say it to a person because, well, we just don't know. God may have chosen you, and we just don't know yet. You're going to have to persevere until the end. And how do we know if they're saved or not is if they persevere till the end. Well, you could have a guy preaching for 50 years, and then he just quit, and then they would say what? Well, he was never, he was never saved. Well, stop and think about that. You had an unsaved guy for 50 years leading your congregation. Do you see the problem with that? And, and, and so that, that's one of those things that come along from that. But it's a misuse of Romans 9 and a bunch of other verses as well. Um, when Paul talks about predestination, what, what we're predestined to is to be what? The form of, of, of who Christ is. That, that's, that's our destiny now. God has chosen that he would make whoever becomes part of the nation or the nation of Israel, what he's going to do with them and the ones who become part of the body of Christ, they're what they're going to be, be with, with that. And there's, there's, there's those issues there. But when we look at, when we look at that doctrine, it, it, it completely flips it all. And to hear people talk about it and preach it, it's really hard to sit and listen to. Um, and of course we've said the guy that comes on us on before us on the radio station and that's all he does. It's not yeah, it's not allowed on when, when Delilah's in the car. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go back here to Genesis chapter 25. Now that's my, that's my anti-Calvinism box rant. So, my, uh, Genesis chapter 25, verse 19. Notice. <clears throat> And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, of Padam, uh, Padamaram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, was, uh, with his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Now, stop there for a second. I want you to think about something. The two nations, because we're going to see this here in a second. The two nations that come from Rebecca, from Rebecca what are they doing with, within her womb already? They're struggling. They're fighting. So you look at that, are, are we shocked at seeing some of the things out there that we see out in the Middle East? In the court? It started in her womb. <laughs> but notice he, verse 23, And the Lord said unto her, what? Two nations are in thy womb. 
he's 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 dealing with the fact he's dealing with really the bloodline, but also what the nation that's going to come out of her. And there's two nations here. He says, two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels and the one people shall be stronger and the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. Isn't that the same thing that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 9? So we see that's exactly what's taking place there. And of course, we, we see um, Esau and Jacob there. Uh, again, Israel and, and Edom. And we can go through a lot of stuff with that. But, <clears throat> but when, we, when we look at this back over in Matthew chapter 20, um, where we left off down here <clears throat> in um, verse, verse, uh, verse 25, Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. Notice, but Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. What's he saying? Here's how this works. When we look at the way that our country is ran, how is our country ran? You got the great people up here, and what are they doing? They're ruling everybody else. Every Gentile country, that's the way it works. Um, there was a thing for a few months. They were uh, a little TikTok craze. Kids ask me all the time. I was like, when was the last time you thought of Rome, the Roman Empire? All right, that was a thing a few months ago. And I was like, I think about it every day because we live in it. We live in modern-day Roman Empire. And what happened to the Roman Empire? Are they still around today? No. So what's that tell us about us? <laughs> no. Yeah. So, I mean, you look at that, and the idea is every Gentile nation, how is it that they ran? The greatest person, they're going to rule everybody. And that's exactly what he's talking about there. They, they, they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever shall be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Now, Delilah asked, when, when Paul brings up the issue of, of in, hold your place there, go to First Timothy, where he talks about um, the chief, right? Uh, First Timothy chapter 1. What's interesting to me is... Um, if you wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna hide some truth, what's one way to hide some truth is just, just kind of well, either don't talk about it or just change something to notice. What is, what is it that most denominations think of Paul as he's what the chief of sinners? He's the worst one. And so what they do is they take that word chief and what do they make it? It's the worst one. Well, you stop and you think about that. You go to any American Indian tribe and ask them for the chief. Are they going to bring out the worst guy in the group? They're going to bring out the leader, right? The first one, top dog type thing. Notice this. In, in first, uh, first Timothy chapter 1, um, notice verse 15. He says, This is the faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, does he say that he's the chief sinner or the chief of sinners? He's the first. There's an issue there. So when we think about, and you stop and you think about this, and this is one of those things, you know, when we talk about if, if we're doing what the church, the body of Christ is, is designed to do here, and another church is doing what the church, the body of Christ is supposed to be doing there, and another church is doing what the church, the body of Christ, is supposed to be doing there. What happens is every one of us, the entire church is edified, right? Built up. And so then when you think about this, <clears throat> if Paul was, think of Paul being the greatest, has he served you and I through his ministry? He really has. That's what I was thinking. That could be correlated. There, and that's why I was saying, yeah, hang on to that. Because that you know you think about that has he served us in a way that we maybe not even thought of before just because through him is written this wonderful revelation of truth, um, and you think about you think about those things does does the greatest mean I'm the best one in God's eyes is no, but how do the Gentiles think of it you know the idea of 
Um, the goat in basketball, right? Who's the goat? Who's the goat? Is it LeBron or Michael? And everybody's like, well, it's this guy because of this, and it's this guy. And what are they doing? This guy's got a better resume than this guy. That's how people, that's how we Gentiles normally think about things. But when God looks at it, the greatest is what? The one that's serving. Now, should all of us serve? The answer is yes. But it's interesting. That's what he's going to be able to get to, and we'll see that. But notice he says, um, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. So what's, what is it that Paul is telling us there is what? What God's doing right now today began with who? Me. <laughs> That's what he's saying. And what if you don't like that? What if you want the church to start in Acts 2? What are you going to say about Paul? Well, he was the chief of sinners. You change his identification, right? Change who he is. Well, if I can make him the worst guy rather than something that God's doing something specific with or something special with, what can I do is I can hide who he is and I can hide his ministry. And that's exactly what takes place. And so then what's interesting is, is <clears throat> he tells us, verse 16, how be it for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should what? Hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. <clears throat> so, Paul sets out here, he is the first one that gets this, and God shows as a pattern, and here we are way down here, has Paul served us in a way that we not even really think about sometimes, right? Not just as our apostle, but what? As an example, we read it about Timothy this past weekend about being an example of the believer, like you, you can look at the life of Paul and you can understand what an example of a life of a believer would look like. Um, and so then the idea is, what should I always want to do is, well, if I want to be greatest or greater, what, do I, what should I do? Serve. That's not the normal mentality. Normally we, we want, there, there's times I've, I've seen shows and, and uh, I forget what it was. Um, a month or so ago, I was, I was watching something and, and they were like, man, I just, I want, I want to sit back in a chair and I want people to feed me and I want them to fan me with, you know, I want people to come and serve me. That's how we think. That's the natural response to service is I want to be served. But what we're going to see is that's the opposite of how they're going to work. And that's what, that's what Christ is bringing up there, right? Um, let's go back over Matthew chapter 20. Um, verse 27, again, he says, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. And like you stop and you think about that for a second. That, does, that, does that kind of change your thought on some things every once in a while? Is, instead of looking for a way to be served... What if we just thought of ways to serve? And it just completely changes the mindset. Go back to Matthew chapter 18, and we'll see it, right? We'll, we'll see exactly what's taking place there. Um, and what he's doing here is he's given us an illustration with this child. Now, <clears throat> what, what a lot of times people do is they'll say, well, um, look to the child. But notice, notice what he's doing here. Verse 2, And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, what's interesting is, <clears throat> who called the child over? Who set the child in the middle of them? So, you're, okay, there, there's something there. But notice he says, And verily I say unto you, except ye be converted. 
What's he telling them? You need to change your mind on the way you're thinking about how this hierarchy works. He's saying what? You need to change your mind. Just simply believe as this little child does. And what's interesting is, is this little child actually represents the little flock. And instead of, you know, it, and, and no, just keep on going. Because it, it, to me, it's just this, this is one of those things is just kind of, it, it is because you go through and their whole idea is what? Well, Peter's got this. So what am I getting? Right. We went over to Matthew 20 and the mother of Zebedee's kids comes up and says, OK, well, can you give my my guys one on your right, one on your left? Give them something because, you know, they were up in the mountain with Peter as well. They've got to get something yeah. right. And the whole idea is he's he's telling them what? That's not the way to think about this. The way to think about this is how are you going to humble yourself and serve rather than wanting to be served? Notice um, <clears throat> He says, and, and, and verse 3, And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted to become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, you stop and think about that. What is, what is their eternal life? Their eternal life is the kingdom. Right? You stop and you think about this. Hold your place there. Go over to... Uh, Yes, and the difference is is they have to wait until the kingdom comes to get theirs. And we've already got it as a present possession. But do they lose it? Do they, do they have to, can they gain it and then lose it, gain it and then lose it? Well, they've never gotten it yet, right? So, you, you know, you're thinking about, thinking about those things uh, a little bit more as we go through too. Um, go over to Acts chapter 3. Right, and of course, this is this is one of the verses or one of the passages we like to go to a lot because words mean things, right? And when we read these things, it, the stuff means exactly what it means. Notice um, Acts chapter three, verse twelve, and when Peter saw it, talking about what was taking place with the the guy that just uh, that they just healed, the lame man. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel. So who is it that he's who is it that he's addressing? Men of Israel. He says, Why marvel ye at this, or why look ye so stead or earnestly on this, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Now stop and think. Two weeks ago, when we were going through Matthew 17, they try to heal a guy, and what happens? Doesn't happen. And the reason why is we found out it was because of their unbelief, not because they stopped believing they could heal. It's because they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was going to actually go and be crucified and be raised again the third day, right? In the context of what's going on here, what are they doing? They're healing again. Well, that tells us what they now believe that. And what we looked at before, when you go back to Matthew a little bit earlier, when we looked at those as how is it that that's going to work is when the bridegroom's gone, what are they going to do? They're going to pray and fast. And what happens is, are they able to now heal a man? The answer is yes, right? And so they, they're understanding what's going on. It's not by their power, but it's because of the power that, uh, that, uh, that they have from the Holy Spirit. Now, drop down to verse, um, verse 19. Um, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. He says, Repent ye therefore, because of the things that, that he's talking about through there, how they killed the prince of life and how they, they, um, they should actually understand what, what the suffering of Christ was. Verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted. Why? What's the purpose of them repenting and being converted? Again, change your mind and move forward with what you believe. And what's he say? What's the purpose of them doing that as to what? that your sins may be blotted out. Right then? No. no. He says, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. In order for them to have their sins blotted out, what has to take place? Christ has to come back. When is He going to come back? 
Second coming has nothing to do with eclipses, right? He comes back. And I know Delilah tells me not to point at stuff up here when it's not up here. There's imaginary things, right? So everybody, everybody else sees it, right? There you go. There you go. So you got the seventieth week of Daniel, right? Jesus Christ comes back, and what's he going to do? Is he's going to set up his throne here on earth? When, and when they go into that kingdom, what is it that they're going to get? Their sins forgiven. They're going to have this, right? When they get that, what is it that they're going to have? Eternal life. When they go into the kingdom, what is it that they're going to have? Is they're going to have eternal life. So when you go back over here to um, Matthew 18, and he says in verse 3, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. What's he telling them? In order to get there, what do you need to do is you need to change your mind. One thing about me going to a cross. Another thing, you have to change your mind of what? How that kingdom is going to work. All right, and there's there's a whole bunch of things that go in through with that. So are you saying that then that one of the things that they needed to be convinced of, they didn't know what was going to all the circumstances that would become because of the cross, but they had to believe he was going to go to a cross and die. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and it's the other part was hidden, right? And it was yeah, and so so what happens is, is he's already told them twice that he's going to go to a cross. And they still don't believe him. And their whole point is, they're like, okay, yeah, but let's get to talk about this. Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? Right? And, and what he's wanting to show them is, here's, here's how it's going to work. Notice, um, verse 4, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself is this little child. What's the issue there? Humility. Right? Um, go over to Philippians. Yeah, yeah, and we'll we'll talk about that. Um, Philippians chapter two. Mm -hmm. Yep. Philippians chapter two, and I know everybody online's like, quit saying yep, repeat the question, answer the question. I get it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yet I always forget. <laughs> Yeah. They're just, every, everybody online, just like everybody in the congregation knows every answer. So why is Greg teaching? So <laughs> Philippians chapter two, it's like, yes, you're correct. <laughs> Everything you've said that no one else can hear. All right. Uh, Philippians chapter two. And we've, we've, we've discussed this and talked about this before, but, but I want you to, I want to remind you of this. What's the greatest example of humility is right here, Philippians chapter 2, notice, let this mind be in you, which, also, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, what's he, what did he say to these guys over here is what? <clears throat> you need to what? Be converted. You need to change your mind, right? What's, what's Christ say here in verse 5, or Paul through, Christ through Paul in verse 5 says what? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's saying what? Think the same way that Christ would have thought. In every situation of life, there is a way that you can think the way that Christ has thought. But if you don't know how Christ would have thought in that situation, then what are we going to be left with is the way that we think. So what do we need to do? Find out how Christ would have, would have dealt with that situation. And that's the issue. Notice in verse 6, the context before that is what? Esteeming others better than themselves, right? And he's saying, let this same thought process that Christ had be in you. Verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Was Jesus Christ equal with God? Yes, 100%. Did he think that he was equal with God? Yes. Did he think it was robbery to think that he was equal with God? No. He was God in the flesh, right? Verse 7, What's that very first word? But. 
as God, he chose to do something. Notice, but made himself. When you, when you think of that, 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 those two words, if you make yourself, what are you doing? You're making a conscious decision based on something to do what you're going to do. All right? So then when Paul says, esteem others better than themselves, what, are you, what is it that he's saying is what? Make the conscious decision based on the doctrine to put other people's issues before your own. That is absolutely contrary to the natural man's thinking. And that's even to the people who don't wish you well. Yeah, right? yeah. But notice he says, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Now, wasn't he being in the form of God? But he did what? He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. The form of a servant does what? What's a servant do? Serves based on what? Esteeming you better than myself. And what's he teaching them here is what? If you want to be greatest, what should you do? Serve. To get something? No. And that's their, that's their idea, right? Is well, And that's why the mom shows up, and as Lisa said last week, she's pretty sure that the two boys put the mom up to it to make her the fall guy, right? But the idea is what? Go tell him all the stuff that I, I deserve these two positions because we've done X, Y, and Z. Can tell mom, no. and, yeah. And who's going to say no to mom? Well, Christ did, right? But anyway. But you look at that, and the idea is not... Okay, well, look at all the stuff I've done. I deserve this. Now, you make that parallel with the judgment seat of Christ. When we get to the judgment seat of Christ, are we going to tell God, hey, we deserve this because we've done X, Y, and Z? The answer is no, right? Because it's not based on things that we do. It's based on what? His life in us. And who's going who's to cause us to serve the way that Christ served? Christ is. And to me, I think, you know, you look at this stuff and it's like, this is a beautiful picture. And the greatest example of humility and being humble is exactly right here. Notice, <clears throat> but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And let me pause there for a second. When he says, and made himself of no reputation. What is it that we sometimes look for is what? I want to be the guy that's right on this topic so that I have a reputation. You want, you want to know something about this? Go talk to Joe, right? But what did Christ do? He made himself of no reputation. He was, like he, he was like, I'm going to come here. I am God, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to have, I'm going to go as no reputation and I'm going to take upon myself the form of a servant and was what? Made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and be, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And you stop and you think about that. He chose of his own free will to do what? Go to a cross so that we could have salvation. And he went, through, he went through the physical pain. And, you know, years ago on Easter, we, we, years ago we did this. Um, we read, we read what, a, what a doctor says that a person goes through when they're, when they're crucified. And the physical agony and the pain that they go through and the fact that basically you're suffocating until you die. And so then we always focus on that, and that's bad. The, the, the stripes that he had, all the pain that he went through, the thorns, the, thorn of, of crown, the crown of thorns, not just placed on his head, but pushed down into his skull. And we think about all the physical pain that he went through. But he also went through that spiritual agony of that separation, that second death that we deserve he not only took upon himself that form of a servant to do what he did, but he said what? 
I'm not only going to take the physical pain, but I'm also going to take the spiritual pain. And he'd never experienced separation from the Father. Have you ever thought about that? And then he says what? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And at that moment, what takes place is, is he says what? He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. To know that at a point he dies, both the physical and the spiritual He's not, he's not suffering that anymore. When you, go to a, when, you go to a, when you go to a Catholic church, they still got him on the cross, right? He's, he's gone from that. <laughs> he raises the third day, and he ascends to the Father, and the Father accepts his work and sends the Holy Spirit as proof that he accepted the work. And then we can look at that and say what? He's the greatest because he served us. And you just think about that. That's what Christ is bringing up. Is you all are worried about a position based on you doing something. He said, if you want to be greatest, go serve. Can they serve the same way that he served? He can't. None of them can go and die for other people. But can they go put their life on the line and lose it for him? The answer is yes. And many people have done since then. And, and you see that. Um, go over to, I um, eh, don't know how much time we got left, but go to, uh, <clears throat> well, I don't know if we have time to do that. Yeah. Go back to Matthew chapter 18. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, the problem with that is if he's still on the cross, then you have no resurrection. Right? And so, you know, there, it, it's, a, it's a state of he's just always dead. Right? If you've got him there. Now, that's not what they believe, but that's a picture that you send. Right? Um, but I see what you're saying. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but notice, back over here in Matthew chapter 18, there is a, because this is what he brings up, verse 4, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What's he equating the greatest with is not who was first, who was last, but it's what? Go serve. Humbleness. Now, Bob Jones uh, from Bob Jones University um, this was, a, this was a quote that he, he'd said years ago. He said, Humility is um, truth's most becoming garb. Now, garb you think of is what? Like your clothes and stuff like that. That's the way he's meaning it. And he's saying what? Humility is truth's most becoming garb. If you want, if you want to put on display truth, and of course that issue of becoming means to be what? To be suitable. Uh, belonging to the character of, right? So he's, he, what he's saying is humility is truth's most becoming garb. If you, want to, if you want your life to portray humility the way, or if you want, if you want to portray life in your, in your life truth, how are you going to do that is through humility, right? And that's what he's saying. And that's what Christ is bringing up here. And he's bringing up this issue of this this humbleness um and again as i've said the mentality that we have or the attitude that we have that's not what comes natural is to be a servant um it doesn't come from us um let's go to uh, go to luke chapter 10 we'll finish up here um, Luke chapter 10.
I just noticed I got another verse there. But notice this, Luke chapter 10. Um, we we kind of looked at the first part of this before, but notice in verse, verse 20. <clears throat> Um, Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Notice what we've got here. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for, it, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Who is it that got that information? Who is it that he's saying that he's, he's thanking the Lord? He's saying what? I thank, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these, from, these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto who? Babes. What's he, what's he pointing out there is what? There's, there's, there's an issue of you think the world looks at this, you know, Kentucky, you know, we talked about this. Kentucky just got rid of Calipari, all that stuff. They're bringing a guy in. They're offering him $8.8 .8 million. And you're like, well, he's got to be a really great coach to get $8.8 .8 million. That's the way we think in our culture is who's got the most, they're the winner. And it's the exact opposite of what, what Christ is talking about here. And again, it's that issue, who's getting it? Who's getting this information? Who's this information being revealed to is who? Not the ones that are the great nation, but who? The little flock. <laughs> right? And that's the point. That's the picture that he's bringing up there. They were a, what the, what the nation would consider a disobedient and a gainsaying people. They, they're, they're out there doing that. Um, they're out there. They have no faith. They're that disobedient and gainsaying people, but they're not getting this truth. But who's getting the truth is that little flock. Right? And so you think about those things as, as we continue on in Matthew 18. Um, and of course, we've not really gotten too far into this, but um, here in Matthew 18, we start seeing exactly what Christ is bringing up. And then um, verse 5, we'll stop there, Matthew 18, 5. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. And the idea there is what? When he sends out the twelve and they receive the twelve, who are they really receiving is not the twelve, but Christ. Now, of course, you get a little bit farther on. There's some other passages you can go to that go along with this. And he says they're not really accepting receiving me, but they're receiving the one that sent me. Hello. Why is it so hard to believe the flip side of that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it's against, it's oh. against nature. Oh, oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, with Paul, yeah. Well, and, and, but here's the thing. We've said it before. We can look at it and say, how can you not see it? And that's what Christ is telling the little flock here. And the little flock's like, how do you all not see it? It's the same kind of idea. And what's going to happen is human, human nature, human viewpoint, human thinking is going to be what? Well, if you're a real church, you got thousands of people. You got a bank full. Well, no, you're in debt up to your eyeballs, if not higher, because that's what they look at. Right. It's not how much money have you brought in. It's like how much money do you have in the bank against your <laughs> there? There was a guy that I work with in Lexington. And he said, yeah, we just did a remodel and uh, we're 15 million dollars in debt. Oh my God. And I'm like, doesn't sound like the Lord's blessing you there if you're in debt. And it's that world system, right? We got to go in debt to get money, to get it to look good, to bring people in. And it's it's the complete wrong way to do it. What's the best way? What's the best way to go to a group of people that don't want your message is what? Go serve them. And where do, where where can that start? Is it can start in the home, and it can start in the church, and then it's going to follow you in your life and your daily job and all that stuff. And that, that's really the issue that, that Christ is bringing up here in Matthew 18 is saying what? Humble yourself like this little child. And what he's saying to the nation is what? Humble yourself like the little flock has. Is really the big, the big picture there that he's, that he's bringing up. It's going to be hard to be a good 
servant mm -hmm. God to people, isn't he? Because all your principles are messed up. Yeah. You're still going to have a human nature ruling you. Is that fair? No, it would be fair. Because the idea there is <clears throat> if, if you don't know who you are right now, for instance, if you don't know that you're a member of the Church of the Body of Christ and you have all these things given to you to make it possible to make that choice of your own to go serve, but if you think that you have to go and do something to gain something from God, yeah, and that's, that's what it is. And, and, yeah. Yeah. But if you're if you're putting out false stuff, how is that being an effective servant? You're not you're working your fingers to the bone, right? Mm -hmm. Which he does. Yes. No name necessarily, which he does. Mm -hmm. But if you're putting out false doctrine, what's it matter? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the same thing. It you know, it, goes hand in hand, right? it does, and it, it'd be the same thing. Is like, is is there a difference? It, you know, and I think about I think about this stuff all the time because I've heard people say to other people is like, you know, oh, you go to Greg's church or it's not my church. Right. And I think of this stuff all the time. If I ever get to the point where I think I'm the main person or I'm the top dog type thing, I want out. Because I'm not. Because, again, it's that issue of. What's the real issue is, is what serving. But you're still a leader. Yes, and that that that's yes, but that's 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 not that's not what I'm talking about as far as that. But if I get to the huh? Is this James and John? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's Zebedee's mom. Yeah, the mom's over here is like, oh, you're. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, that, that idea of if I ever got to the point, and I guarantee you, there are people that stand behind pulpits that have this thought process of, I'm it. Most of them. And the reason they're there is because they think, I'm the, I'm the best guy right now. Yeah. Yeah. God spoke to me and said that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's... You come to a point where you start to recognize it, and you go, eh, this doesn't mean so much for it. Well, it, if the man standing out there, or woman, you know, you know, that's wrong anyway, but um, believes, you know, and, and, and thinks that God speaks directly to them, what does that do to the others who, who don't hear that? You know what I'm saying? You can make up anything you want. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's, that's, yeah, and that's the thing is if you go around, like, like everybody in the last month or so, God spoke to me about the eclipse, here's what's going to happen. Then what do you automatically do with that person is you put them up on this pedestal because God's spoken to them, so that I've got to listen to them. But you look at that, and then what happens is, is none of the stuff comes, comes through like they said, so they still listen to them. Yeah, and you give away your freedom. Absolutely, and you don't even realize it. Man, yeah, teach, I mean, you teach the principle all the time. If it doesn't come from God's word, if it's coming from outer sources, beware. Yeah. You get it from God's word. You can talk about your buddy that works his finger for your money. That's what, yeah. You can apply that to salvation. Oh, yeah. And he's taking Christ out of the world. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. Why Mm -hmm. on YouTube, I'm sorry, but I'm just being honest. No, I know. Yeah. I'm not telling a lie. Yeah. But yet, he's, he's out there promoting false doctrine, but people think he's a yeah. hero. Oh, yeah. And the, the, yeah. No, and that's a possibility. That is definitely possible. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a possibility. It just shocked me. Um, but, I mean, you look at that stuff, and, and most... Most Christianity looks at that and says, I, I desire to be like that guy, right. right? Lord, make me as good as so-and-so. And you're just like... I mean, I was introduced by a group of people to him as, you can go find this person. 
Jesus, and this is his name. You can go, this is what they said. You can go on YouTube, find him under this title, and you can go find 12 videos about him that the guy made. Yeah. Well, they're, so they view him as a local, kind of local hero. That's like, go ahead. Christ made himself noted. That's right. Yeah. And then this is the opposite of that, isn't it? That's yeah. Right. And and when you when you care more about your reputation and being somebody, then you need to stop doing what you're doing. Yeah. So when when it comes to serving Jesus and disciples, mm -hmm. basically saying humble yourselves and believe as the little flock believes. That... Well, he's saying what he's saying is is humble yourselves and don't think of being the greatest as you got a you got a whole bunch of stuff. You're the best one, but to go and serve then you become the greatest, and that's that issue there. Okay. Change your mind on how the hierarchy works. The child is the little flock. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's speaking to the nation as a whole. You need to humble yourself so as the little flock has. Mm-hmm. And he's getting them both at the same time. Because the disciples are like, who's going to be greatest so in the kingdom? Why wouldn't the disciples already have the same information that the Jesus disciples have? Mm -hmm. And believe the same thing that the little flock believes? Well, they do, because they're part of the little flock. But that's why I'm saying there's a two-fold issue there. He's telling the, he's telling the, he's telling the, the disciples, you're thinking of the things the wrong way. You should think of, go serve, because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, when you serve, when you when you humble and serve, then you'll be the greater in the kingdom. But he's also speaking to it's, it's a it's a message to the to the entire nation is you need to go be like the little flock because the little flock is there are no people, there are no nation, they're not thought of as the the. He's talking to everybody, but he, it says he's talking to. The he's child. speaking directly to the disciples, yes, but it's it's also he's he's talking to. The, the entire nation of Israel is going to be able to read Matthew chapter 18 and they're going to know exactly what it is too. But yeah, he's speaking directly to the disciples, absolutely 100%. Yeah. But it's a message for them too. So what I'm wondering is how does all this if at all? So when we're going to be in heavenly places, but we're going to be in positions, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm wondering how this principle... Does it relate to us in the heavenlies? There's a parallel. A parallel so, you know what I mean, as far as attitude or as far as what you're going to be, I don't know, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. It's, it's, are they related it's, to there is a parallel because Judge of the Seat of Christ, the whole issue, and we talked about that before, is the whole issue is, is God's Word working in you, right? He's going to produce things. He's going to produce His life in you when you believe His Word and allow His Word to work in you. What oftentimes we think of the justice meat of Christ, which I used to think this way, is the more you know, the better you are. And the higher you are. And the higher you are. And that's not what it is. The more I do, the higher I am. That's a works based thing. But it's really what happens is it's a parallel is when you serve as a member of the body of Christ. And you serve because that's what Christ is doing in you, not because you want to gain something. You're just serving. You look for opportunities. You humble yourself and you look for opportunities to serve. The Word working through you will produce that. Right? They're going to have to do that themselves before they get in the kingdom and all that. The new covenant comes along and He puts this, His Word in their hearts and they're going to do those things. <clears throat> So there is a parallel there, too, of humble yourself and don't think, don't think, well, I've got, I had a guy years ago, he told me, he's like, I want to come visit your mansion because I know it's going to be grand because you do this, this, and this. And I was like, I was like, buddy, I'll probably have a shack on the backside of somebody else's property if I've got something. And he was like, no, you're going to, and I was like, no, because you're, you're getting the whole thing confused. You, you're concentrating on the wrong thing. That's the way the Gentiles think, right? The more you do, the more you have, the more you have, the more you get. Um, but when it comes down to it, 
the humility of, of allowing God's word to work in you, saying, I can't do it. The only thing that can do it and do the work is you. Right? When that happens, the word will work and it will produce in you exactly what God's designed to produce. And when it produces that, God's going to reward you for the work that he's doing in you. Not you doing something, but the word. And that's why when we do something in our own power, that's that wood, hay, and stubble. So the heart condition guided by God's word working through you. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's you're changing your mind based on the verses saying, I'm not going to think this way. I'm going to think this way and I'm going to allow the so word of God to work. We need to renew our mind daily. daily. Yeah. So in the humility of the death ground, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the cross changed the apostles as well. Mm-hmm. They, they were going into it thinking, I'm going to sit on the right and or maybe I'll sit on the left, but I'm going to be judging the 12 tribes. Yeah. But see, the cross was called that way. So yeah. Yeah. See, what do we do now? Yeah. See, that's what they're thinking. And mm-hmm. it's the same for us. If we think we can do anything like he's talking about, all of our works are going to burn up. Yeah. But at the cross, that's where we find thank you for the cross. Thank mm-hmm. you for the burial. Thank you for the resurrection. Yeah. And it's that, that thankfulness of mind, that's what it will produce. The humility of life, of his life, will produce thanks, thanksgiving. To him, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Greg is a great dude. Oh, but, like and, and, but now here's the thing. You think about it. He's the only one in town of this part of Kentucky that's teaching right division. Yeah. yeah. That's a great deal. Number two, yeah. on top of that, if I can add to it, you mix leadership with humility. Well, I've and that's. So many leaders. I've been witnessing them. <laughs> They could teach something. It's like, oh. No sign of humility about them. They no, no. mannerisms, how they spoke, the tone they used, the, even some of the material and the way they presented it. You can be a strong leader and show that. In fact, the strongest leaders know how to be strong leaders, yeah. which you are, and show humility. Yeah. That's it. I appreciate that. I mean, that's, I mean that, that's just Christ living that's it. in me. Important. And... It shows. I mean, I. If you weren't preaching, I wouldn't give you a second. Yeah. At this point, I wouldn't give you a second. Yeah. No, not, not appreciate that. Oh, yeah. But it's nice when you walk in here to find somebody like you and I did teaching right division, but can also mix humility with the fact they're teaching the right thing. Well, you said you wouldn't give him two seconds. If I had If he wasn't teaching right division. Yeah. Well, why would I? I've been through all the other crazy. Yeah. That's uh, been crazy. To be honest, <laughs> that's why I spent so long before I found you all not going anywhere. I yeah. Said, I'm not going to do it anymore. I don't want to. Yeah, I could go make some new friends. We've had out. 10 years at least. Yeah, 10 years and never met with anybody. Well, I mean, when we first moved here, very hard. when we first moved here, there were, there were people that were like, hey, come to our church, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I can't. Right. The message well, won't sure. allow me. Yeah. So I mean, and it just, I couldn't. the The message wouldn't allow me just to go anywhere. I can't. So I get, I completely get what you're talking about. I wish y'all could have been there the first time I come to the door. Okay, I was there. I was there. Not the first time. No. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That there was nobody in Frankfurt. Yeah. Or yeah. Well, I'm just saying, because I've been listening a long time, and I was like, I'm going to get let down. Yeah. yeah. I don't know this time. I'm sick of it. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, that's right. No, no. And I, and, and I appreciate your boldness in that, too. Um, yeah. Because that's, that, that's what that does. I mean, the message, and, and that's the thing, is, is the boldness that comes from the humility is really interesting. And, and that's really hard for people to, to kind of balance because 
if you're bold in, in proclaiming the truth that you know, um, people think that you're not humble. But that boldness comes from Christ, and that's I mean, Paul Paul brings that up too. He's like, I, I'm going to I'm I'm coming to you in the in the humbleness of Christ. I'm <clears throat> Mm -hmm. when she was trying to tell her sister about right division. Mm -hmm. I'm a little hurt. <laughs> because your mother's nicer than me. <laughs> it's true, Mark. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but no, I mean, and that's, that's yeah. an interesting thing because when you do that, when you, when you come across absolutely certain. Yeah. There's an assurance that comes along with that message. There's a boldness that comes along with that message. And it's not you being arrogant. It's just, I'm just, I'm humble enough to believe the verse. It is. It's the, it's the Spirit working through you. Yeah. And of love and a sound mind, yeah. What were you going to say, Scott? Mm -hmm. um, I guess it, on the opposite side of that, though, wouldn't that be more? Of a, wouldn't that also be an example? I guess would studying and wanting to gain more knowledge be a, be an example of serving because you're doing it with the intent of wanting to that, quote, being prepared to give an answer? Yeah, I mean that that's part of it. I mean, and and being able to. Being able to, if somebody asks you a question of why do you believe what you believe, well, it, can I tell you, it's okay to say I don't know right now. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I will tell you this, and I've, I've, I've seen this from experience. You will gain more respect for a person by saying I don't know, I will get back to you, than to just make something up. Because a lot, get the answer. It might take like years yeah, but I mean, and that's the beautiful thing. And, and, you know, David Giuliani asked me one day, he was like, did you ever imagine that the way that things work here, like the fact that you all can feel open enough and vulnerable enough, I guess, to ask questions, even during a message, he was like, did you ever imagine that that's the way it would be? I was like, that's there's a, there's a term form follows function. If you say, okay, we're going to do these things this way. Here's your form. Now you got to function in that form. My thing is, is the form follows function. If we function that way, that's the form, right? And if, and if you feel comfortable enough to ask questions and things like that. And, and he told me, he said, the fact that you can say, I don't know. He's like, that's, that's a great thing. And that's one thing that I've learned <clears throat> is it's okay to say, I don't know, rather than just to make up something off the top of your head. Because what you can end up doing is you could create, you could create um, a block for somebody to learn for themselves. And you can actually hinder their growth. Um, yeah. And you say, well, you got to go do this. Um, so I, I think it's, I think it's amazing that, that, People feel that comfortable to so for to lady, speak. When I have been a part of it, well, this is the first assembly I've ever, ever been a part of in years. Mm -hmm. You mean in every assembly I've ever been in, you would be considered almost an outcast or just so rude if you actually interrupted during a, even if you raise your hand, if you interrupt during a message to ask a question. Yeah. So far, you don't forget what you're going to ask yeah. anyway. So yeah. that's what I've been a part of. But I mean, and, and, that, and again, is there anything wrong with that? No. no but how, how do you go about doing it? If you're completely shut off from the person who's teaching, you can't ask any questions ever. That's not good. And you want your people to have a desire to learn. Yeah. Well, and it's hard enough. I, couldn't, I would 
be able to imagine the Rita Burson standing up there in front of everybody teaching. That's part of not being able to tell. But to get questions, you have no idea what's going to come out of the mouth of somebody. You know? Yeah. And you might not be able to answer it. That takes a lot of I don't know. I don't know. It, to me, it's um, it's an humbling experience um, to do this, and and um, I can see when Paul says in First Timothy three that if a man desireth the work of a bishop, he desireth a good work, because I think it is. Yeah. It's a very unique work. It is, um, and it's just to me, it's one of those things. It's really, it's a it's a wonderful thing, but. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, I, I'm I'm okay with that. I'm okay with not notoriety and all that. Man, I am not a Corvette. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can see your face. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Man, you, does anybody bring their boots with them tonight? It's getting a little deep now. Uh, yeah. No. I, and I appreciate those. I mean, and and, and again, it's just. I enjoy I enjoy doing what we do, and I'm I'm, I'm like thankful. Can I give you a lot of big head? Sure. Yeah. Richard Jordan says the hardest position in the church is the white pastor. It is true. Pastor's yeah. I don't know about that. I mean, no, no, it 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 is true. It is true. It is true because because people will go to Delilah and, and talk to her and ask her stuff rather than me. I've already experienced that. Yeah. So and that's fine. That's her. That's her burden to bear. So, <laughs> no. Um, but it, it it is interesting. <laughs> that too. I wouldn't want that. Yeah, I wouldn't want that either. So, all right. Um, well, we'll pick up technically in verse five, going on down through, and we'll see. We'll say that issue of the offend, and it's interesting because this is right on the heels of where he says lest we offend them, go down to the fish and get the money, right? So there's, there's an issue there, and we'll talk about that uh, next time. So I greatly appreciate you all being here, and I, I appreciate the kind words. Folks online, thank you all for being with us, and uh, look forward to seeing you Sunday morning. Father.